Joining us this first hour is, without question, one of my, my favorite authors on the planet. He is uh, extraordinary in his research, his insight, and the revelations that he brings forth in each and every book that he writes. Uh, his name is Dr. Joseph Farrell. I think many of you know the name. He's been on the program off and on for years. His newest book, he's got a couple of them out we're going to talk about, is very interesting, Covert Wars and the Clash of Civilizations, UFOs, Oligarchs, and Space Secrecy. Joseph is an Oxford-educated historian, but beyond that, he's just an all-around great guy, and uh, good to have you back on the program, Joseph. Well, thanks for having me back, Jeff. That that was quite a nice plug, so, <laughs> so thank you. I mean, seriously, uh, <laughs> it's it's all there. You write about things that most people can't even dream about, and what you write about is the truth, and that makes it even more fascinating. I mean, the truth, information, of course, and knowledge, but information is probably the most powerful commodity on the planet, and the controllers know that, and they use it ruthlessly. Uh, they little little out here and there, then they reel it back in, uh, and it's up to us to try to dig it out. Now, we've got the Internet. We didn't have that 30 years ago. So it makes it a little more interesting, and it, it gives, uh, gives us a fighting chance. Uh, what This book is a sequel to... Tell us about the first one. Well, the first one in this little series was a book called um, Saucers, Swastikas, and Psyops. And then the one after that was a book called Covert Wars and Breakaway Civilizations. And then this one is covert wars and the clash of civilization but all three of those books are actually kind of part of a much bigger series that i've been writing oh i think since about 2005 about uh, nazi secret weapons development yeah. and, and uh, some of the historical implications of what they were doing and, and how they continued this whole program after the war so it's, it's been quite a long series actually and these are kind of the most recent installments well, it, it, is, it is really the biggest post-World War II story of all, yeah. and it, it goes right back into the war years as well. This yeah. is, uh, this is a, a verboten subject. Uh, people oh, yeah. <laughs> don't talk about it. And I, I'm wondering, in, in the nine years since you put the first book out in this, it's a long, it really is a long series. It's one single body of work, but it's in pieces. Yeah. How much information... Have you been able to uncover, unearth, and ferret out uh, over the years that has surprised you? Do you keep finding new things that are oh, amazing? Oh, yeah. Again? Oh, yeah. There's, Jeff, there's so much that, that, you know, I feel like I'm scratching the surface here. And wow. there's so much going on in terms of, of what they were doing and what the implications are and how it continued and, and bled into... Uh, the post-war American national security establishment and, and what we see going on in the country. You know, we're, we're becoming fascist. In fact, I think we're probably already uh, there. I think, I think we're there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not for nothing that I pointed out in another book of mine called The Nazi International that the German military surrenders at the end of World War II. But two things that you don't see on the surrender document are anyone signing directly on behalf of, of the Reich government itself. And you don't see anybody signing on behalf of the Nazi party. So in other words, the oh. only thing that you ever see represented on the surrender documents are, are the German army, the German uh, navy, and, and, and the Luftwaffe. So, you know, that's part of the story. But the bigger part of the story is, is I, as far as I'm concerned, is, is how all this plays out after the war and, and how it plays out both independently in, in certain Nazi enclaves in, in Latin America and so on, and Africa as well. You, you know also, uh, you, you know Harry Cooper? Yeah, I the name is familiar to me. But I, yeah, he runs the organization uh, SharkHunters.com. Oh, that's right, yes, yes, yeah. yes. And he, certainly... he just returned from another trip to Argentina... Uh -huh. and is putting together what I expect to be the ultimate book on what really happened to uh, Adolf Hitler and, and Eva Brown. 
Uh, oh, yeah. After the war. Uh, you know, and I know, and I think many of our listeners know, although history doesn't accord us any slack, uh, we know that Hitler and Brown and many others uh, got out of Germany and lived out yep. their lives in Argentina. Yep. And uh, Harry is putting together... His, his first book really, Escape from the Bunker, 20 years ago, opened the door to this. And yep. unfortunately, in the last year or so, there have been several people stealing his material, as, as is the the bellwether of our times. It's the plagiarism yeah. and theft. Well, Harry is, is uh, and I've been talking to him at some length about this, and he he just came back, and I don't want to take up too much time, but just briefly, he has found people who waited on them. Oh, who, yeah. Who, you, you know the story I'm telling our listeners. Yeah. Uh, th- this is the real deal, folks. And, and the bigger picture is covered in Joseph Farrell's books. You say, well, how could that happen? He had to be the most hunted man on the planet. <laughs> no, wrong. The wrong. deal was made, and yep. the, the deal is very simple. It's very logical. You let all these people go, live their lives in quiet down there, and what do you get in exchange? You get science, you get technology, you get... Atom bomb. <laughs> the unbelievable amount of things. Uh, I, I assume that... Are you are you one of the people who believes that little boy or fat man was essentially a German bomb? Well, I, I don't think that fat man was. Um, and that's interesting that you bring that question up because the very first book that that began this series of, of research into into the Nazi uh, black projects was a book called Reich of the Black Sun. And I wrote that kind of as a context or a backdrop book for everything that follows, because that's the book that I examined kind of a high overview case, really, that that Nazi Germany may have actually acquired the atomic bomb during the war. And the conclusion I came to in the book, Jeff, was that they probably concentrated their development on the uranium bomb only. Mm-hmm. So when I look at it, I'm thinking that perhaps Little Boy that was dropped on, on Hiroshima may have been based on a German design or actually been a captured German uh, bomb of some sort, mm-hmm. um, because I've always found it incredibly suspicious that the U.S. military never tested the thing. And we're told the story that, well, they didn't really have to because they were so confident that this very simplistic <laughs> design of the bomb would oh, work. Au contraire. <laughs> yeah, au oh, contraire. <laughs> it's right. Mm. You know, because what they're asking us to believe is, is something really kind of ludicrous. They're asking us to believe that we would drop an untested bomb mm-hmm. of, of this, this weapon of mass destruction on an enemy combat that we knew full well was working on one themselves. The Japanese were as well. And if this thing should fail to fire for whatever reason, you've just dumped right in their lap all the thistle material to make a bomb of their own. <laughs> so, they would have know. had no trouble picking it up. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, uh, I, I find the whole story to be to be just simply incredible. And, you know, you... you began this by prefacing, well, you know, he was the most hunted man in the world. Why did he get down there? And I explore in another book a kind of a, a, a scenario wherein I think that it's fairly clear from a kind of a complex circumstantial case that Martin Bormann engineered, basically, the transfer of, of German atomic technology to this country in return for the freedom of several high-ranking Nazis, including himself. Uh, and that that all occurred on a U-boat that I know that uh, Commander Cooper has written about as well, called the U-234. This was a U-boat that departed Norway in mm-hmm. the final months of the war in 1945, and it ends up in the United States after having dodged, and this is the really intriguing part of the story, after having dodged the British and Canadians in order to arrange a meeting to uh, be taken captive and then hauled off to the United States. And we helped in this process by jamming Canada's radio signals. Too funny. (laughs) 
it's, yeah, the, the yeah. fix is in. And yeah. when this U-boat was brought ashore, we discovered 80 gold line canisters full of uranium, okay? Now, I emphasize the gold there because this is really an important part of the story. It's a very, very important clue. This submarine was carrying two Japanese officers whom the German crew that was watching them inventory all of the stuff that was to be taken to Japan, including these gold line cylinders, Mm -hmm. wrote on labels that they stuck on these canisters, U-235, okay, uranium-235. The gold is important, Jeff, because what this means was that this was in a state of very high enrichment. You don't put highly enriched uranium in lead because lead is very corrosive with uh-huh. uranium. Uh-huh. And it would, yeah, it would corrupt the sample. So in other words, they're taking every precaution. And from the sounds of everything that I've been able to track down, this uranium was in probably the last stage of, of refinement before it was, ital- pardon me, uh, metallicized mm-hmm. for use as fuel in a bomb. So now, we this have is, that. This is not the only submarine that was uh, dispatched oh, no. carrying this material. Uh, several no. of them apparently made it to Japan. There were a yep. number of them that didn't. Uh, but this one, uh, we got a hold of it. So, And I got a question we'll get to in just a minute. Go ahead, sure. please. Well, there's, there's another little aspect of this story that I find is also very interesting. There's another researcher that really did yeoman's work on this whole German A-bomb subject by the name of Carter Heydrich. And he's an American, published a a very interesting book called Critical Mass. Mm -hmm. And he discovered in his research, Jeff, a statement by the chief metallurgist at Los Alamos, a fellow by the name of Eric Jett, J-E-T-T-E. And this memo came out in December of 1944. In fact, I think it was dated the same day that the Battle of the Bulge began. Mm. And it's basically just a little report on what they're expecting the state of their fissile material to be. And he noted in this in this little memo that the United States wouldn't have enough fissile uranium to make a bomb until about November of 1945, given current rates of, of production at Oak Ridge. Oh. All right. Well, the problem here, obviously, is that we dropped Little Boy on August 6th in 1945. Yeah. And the other problem here is that within two weeks after the su- surrender of this German U-boat with all of these gold line cylinders, mm-hmm. within two weeks of that, the output of Oak Ridge miraculously doubled. <laughs> so funny thing. There's a little creative accounting going on here, but I think sure. the implications are fairly clear. Yeah. Now... The question that a lot of people who have followed this even remotely closely Mm -hmm. would ask is, why didn't the Germans assemble and deploy a bomb? What kept them from it when they essentially had all the ingredients to make this kind of a, a thing happen? Well, there's a lot of factors here in play, Jeff, and that's probably the central question. Um... The way I look at it, the the atom bomb is the hidden logic behind the German officer's bomb plot in, in July of 1944. Hmm. Because in the in the research that that Heydrich and other people have done, particularly over in Germany, that that doesn't get translated into English, the Germans apparently did test, and I actually put the document, uh, the declassified. Uh, document from the American archives that was mm-hmm. declassified in 1992, so that ought to tell us something, <laughs> okay? This is after German reunification, and it's it's an affidavit of a German pilot by the name of Hans Zinzer, mm-hmm. who records to the American interrogation officer that he was witness to, and these are his words, to an atom bomb test sometime in early October of 1944.